I've uh, been preaching for uh, 53 years. And uh, in all of those times of preaching, um, <laughs> just about, <laughs> just about. I've been preaching full time uh, for 53 years. And uh, in all those times of preaching, never felt adequate, never felt I knew really what I was talking about, always longed for the day when it would come and I'd be able to stand behind the pulpit or stand in front of a group of people and preach with confidence and know exactly what I'm talking about and know the fullness of the subject that I have to deal with. And that's never happened in 53 years until this morning. This morning, I feel absolutely confident to talk to you about what we're going to discuss out of this passage. <laughs> so this is a hallmark service. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> oh, my ignorance. Mercy, mercy. Verse 17, chapter 3 of the book of Acts says, Yet now, brother, and I know that you did it in ignorance, as did all your rulers. Ignorance. And I know so much about this subject, ignorance, that it'll take us three Sundays to get through it. <laughs> uh, out of this passage, so uh, hang with me, if you will. Ignorance. My, my. There are uh, four times that uh, this concept uh, that is presented to us in verse 17, uh, researching, I found that there are four times that this subject is presented to us uh, in this way, in this context. And just to mention those to you, because they all have the same impact, and you could preach, I suppose, these same sermons out of those same, out of those same passages. One, of course, is the crucifixion of Jesus in Luke chapter 23, verse 34 where, of course, they've gone through all the trial and they've done through all the, mo uh, the mocking and the, the uh, scourging of the back and all the physical torture that he's gone through. And finally, they've got him nailed to a tree. And he's going through these seven statements that he's going to make uh, as they are recorded for us from the cross. And, of course, one of them is this familiar statement to you where Jesus leans back and cries out, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. There are a lot of issues that arise with that statement. One issue that arises is who is he actually talking about? They do not know what they do. Who is he talking about? Is he talking about the Romans specifically? Is he talking about the Jews specifically? Is he talking about both of them? Are you included in that statement? And if they did not know, did they, what didn't they know? Did they not know they were crucifying an innocent man? Didn't they know that they had to lie to get this done? Didn't they know that they had to blackmail? And didn't they uh, uh, obviously know that they had to push Pilate back into a corner to get this done? Didn't they know they had to connive and compromise and bend and lie and cheat and do everything they could do to get this done? Didn't they know that? Were they ignorant of that? Lots of issues it arises. Another situation where this same passage, this same concept shows up in a passage is 1 Timothy 1.13. And it's in that context that Paul is writing about himself, which may be able to be more specifically applied to your life uh, than even the statement of Jesus. And in that statement, uh, Paul says things like, And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. That's a beautiful statement. But then when he adds this on to it, it makes it more beautiful than even before. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. That also raises a lot of issues. Uh, how on earth could he not know he was blaspheming, he was a persecutor, he was an insolent man? How could he do that by accident? How could he just not know that he was doing the wrong thing? How could that possibly be? 
He says, I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly. What if he hadn't done it ignorantly? Would he have obtained mercy? And what about all of us who have done all of those things and we did it knowingly? Can we still obtain mercy? Lots of issues that it raises. There's the third situation, which is Acts chapter 17, verse 23, and on down into verse 30. It's in that scene that Paul has come to Athens, and of course he's dealing with a whole different group of people than the normal Jews. He's been preaching to Jews and to Gentiles, but now he's come to this Greek situation. And the Greek who are Gentiles, obviously, but they are philosophers, and they gathered around the local courthouse square, and oh, it's on their Saturday, on their day off, and they're doing their normal fun thing to do. They're debating philosophy. And, of course, they've lined this courthouse square with all of these gods and statues of their gods. And so he approaches them not from the Jewish perspective or from the Jewish history standpoint. He doesn't preach from that basis. He comes to them from the basis of philosophy. And as he's talking to them, he's talking about this one statue, this, this one sacrifice offering altar that they have there which is an altar offering sacrifice to the unknown God, and he addresses them on that level. He says, I want to talk to you about this God that you don't seem to know anything about. He's the God Jehovah. He names him out. And as he begins to describe him, he lists the idea that he is a creator and that this unknown God has literally created everything you see and has created us. And this unknown God has created us to be his offspring. And if this unknown God is, uh, has made us to be offspring, then, folks, we are made in his image. And this image thing, the offspring thing of being from the creator God, absolutely means that you cannot consider uh, this, this stuff of silver and gold to be a part of him. In other words, you can't make silver and gold statues, line them up on your platform here, and worship them and think that you're worshiping God because they aren't in his image, we are. And it's a whole different ball game. And he lays this all out for them. And when he gets done with all of that argument, he turns to them and says, you ought to repent, and here's why. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked. And he labels what they had known previously as times of ignorance. God overlooked. But now he commands all men everywhere to repent. Obviously, the fourth situation that gives this, con this concept is found in this verse 17. The context is easy. You know that in verse 12, Peter is standing and he's addressing this Jewish crowd. And he literally is brutal as he describes to them what they have done and who they are and what they have participated in. He describes it in terms of, and we've walked through this for days, but he describes this in terms of you delivered the Christ up. The Messiah that you were looking for all of this time. You say you believe in Jehovah, you've listened to the prophets of old, and all that you've done has, has been focused in on this one single activity of this one single man that you've been looking for. He has arrived, and you know what you did to him? You delivered him up. You denied him in the presence of Pilate, verse 13. Verse 14, you denied him as the Holy One and the just. You even asked for a murderer to be granted to you in his place. You killed, verse 15, you killed the Prince of Life. That's what you're guilty of. He puts the finger on the end of their nose. He literally is brutal. I mean, you are as guilty as you can be. And then when he gets done with that, he turns to this verse. And this verse, he says, Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance. Does that excuse them? Are they as guilty as they've always been? How did they do it in ignorance? Did they not know they were crucifying an innocent man? What on earth? Ignorance. What's contained here? I want to dig into it with you. Let's begin with the idea of a period of time. He introduces that at the very start of the verse. Do you see it? Yet now, brethren, he's suggesting a period of time. The Greek word for yet is K, which is literally K-A-I, which is literally the word and. So that's no problem. 
It's a conjunction. It's a connective conjunction. In other words, he's taking what he's done in the past, what he's already given to them in information and data, as he's already created this overwhelming setting in which he's placed them, this guilt that they now have. Their heads are dropped. Their eyes are focused on the floor. They have this sinking feeling down deep in their gut that they've done the wrong thing and that they are absolutely guilty of what he says because they did participate in this. And in that overwhelming guilt, he literally attaches to that this additional fact. It's accumulative as well as connective. In other words, he's bringing them to a new climax. If he left them here in the fact that they are absolutely guilty, there would be no way out because they could not reverse what they've done. But instead of leaving them there, he adds on to this, this overwhelming statement. You did it in ignorance, yet now. And he's setting up a period of time. In fact, he continues with the word now. It's the word Greek word none. It's a primary particle of present tense. So it's a focus on this moment. So I want you to get the scene of this. This is really important. What he's doing is he's setting up this idea. Over here is your guilt. Here's what you did to the Messiah. Here's how you delivered him up. Here's how you killed the prince of life. Here's how you are the murderer. You wanted a murderer instead of this Jesus. You are as guilty as anyone could possibly be of that. And there's no way out of that. Yet now, I want to talk to you about now. And he sets up then and now. See, this was then, but now something else is going on. Now there's a present tense taking place. Now a new deal is here. Hey, this was your activity then, sure, but now you're on a different level. Yes, this is what you knew then, but now you're on a new realm of knowledge. Yes, this is what, how you operated then. This was the sphere of your influence and, in, and information and data. Here's the context of where you were. But let me tell you, now, in this moment, you have arrived at a new point. You are now, you are then and now. That is forceful. Because, ladies and gentlemen, I understand the then. But I'm not sure I've got a hold of the now. I understand the guilt of then. I know where I've been. And I know what I've done. But the reason I know that so well is now there's been a new revelation. Now I'm in a different spot. Now there's a new realm of information. Now God has done something new in my life. Now God has brought me to a new awareness that I cannot shake. I didn't have that then. I don't know whether I'd have done that then if I'd have known what I know now. I've often said I wish I could be a teenager again knowing what I know now. Would that change things? I think it would. I think it would change everything. I'd probably be real dangerous. The then and the now. See, we've all been in the then. Hey, we all have the guilt. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Come on, there isn't any problem with that. We all know about that. But the issue is not the then. The issue is the now. Because we've all walked into a new realm of knowledge and information. And we're here on a new plane. And what we did then, oh yes, but now, and mercy has come. And knowledge has been given to us. This is the great arena of what we call provenient grace. And we keep talking about it because it's really a key concept. Provenient grace says God isn't going to leave you where you were then. He's going to bring you into the now. You can count on it. Hey, God isn't going to leave you ignorant in what you were. He's going to give you new information. You can count on it. I can promise you that God is literally going to chase you down. I can promise you that God is literally going to come where you are. I can promise you that God is not going to leave you in the then. And you're not going to be able to waller in all of that which you have been. He's going to bring you into a new realm 
realm of information. He has pledged that in his word, and he has desperately, desperately begun to carry that out in your life. And he has hounded you with people, with circumstances, with churches, with knowledge, over the radio, over the television, books, by his spirit, in a thousand different ways. He has literally hounded you down and exposed you to the now. And he's not left you in the then. That presents you with a whole new realm of decision, doesn't it? Which is why he's going to move them into, oh, you must repent. You must respond to the now. See, you, he's saying to them, you shouldn't have come to this service. A lame man who's been healed is dancing around and having a big time on the Solomon's porch. And you were attracted to come over here. You shouldn't have come. My advice is stay out of church. <laughs> Don't go where the Spirit of God is moving. Don't get into the Word. Why? It puts you into the now, and suddenly the then. You have a whole new perspective. But the truth of it is you could stay out of church, and you could stay away from the movement of God, and you could stay away from the services, and you know what? He meets you in your bedroom, so you can't win on this. <laughs> You can't win on this because he's determined to bring you into the now. So he sets up this whole deal of then and now. Now, it's interesting how he ties himself into that, which is the, uh, the second idea that he presents to us in the verse as we begin to walk through it. It's the position of tying. So there's this period of time that he sets up, which is the then and the now. And then he gives this position of tying himself to them he calls them brethren that's really interesting because he hasn't done that up to this time see he's really let, nailed them he's put the finger right on the end of their nose he's he, he's just he's just heaped the brutal guilt all over them he's told them exactly what they did and exactly how they did it and they all stood there absolutely totally guilty and then he turns to them and says hey brethren i'm one of you <laughs> i wouldn't have done that see preachers we really love to preach because in our preaching we talk about them and us you and me see i'm not a part of you i'm here to tell you See, that's why we became preachers, because we weren't in the, on the preaching. We're exempt from the truth of the sermon. But see, when you move from then, it's not you and me, it's not them and us, it's just us. And somehow we all need to hear from God. And somehow we're all in the same position because that's exactly what he's saying about the then for them. Hey, you did this, yeah? You delivered out, sure you did. You asked for a murderer, sure you did. And what was he all about? Hey, I walked with him for three solid years, Peter is saying. Listen, I was in on the miracles, son. Listen, I was there and experienced the parables and the explanation. I, had the, I was one of the inner core group, the three. I experienced the, the, trans, the Mount of Transfiguration, and none of you did. Man, I had things going on. I was related to Jesus. I felt his pulse beat. Listen, I walked in his path, son. I was in his influence for three solid years. You weren't. But lo and behold, you know what? After all of that, then, you want to talk about then, man, I'm as guilty as you are. I denied him three times. When it came right down to it, man, I cussed him before a little old lady, a servant girl, and a man. And I cussed his name and said I didn't know anything about him. Listen, I'm as guilty as you are, brethren. We're in this together. This is not somebody of superiority telling you, oh, you are guilty and I'm not. This is me crawling on my knees saying, listen, I've been where you've been. I've, I've told uh, a, lot of, a lot of you guys that uh, my grandpa said, uh, he asked me what I was going to be and what I was going to do. Uh, I was just a kid. and 
I said, well, I'm going to be a preacher. He said, you can't do that. I said, well, why not? He said, you've never been bad. <laughs> you know, you've got to be bad to be a preacher and then stand up and tell people how bad you've been. Uh, uh, since then, I've learned that he was dead wrong. It's on my mom's side, not my dad's. Uh, he was dead wrong. He was dead wrong, and I've, I've shared this with you. And th this is a basic concept, folks, of the reality of the gospel, that there aren't good sins and bad sins. They're just sins. Well, I never knocked over a bank. Well, but I stole some gum. Well, stealing is stealing, folks. Because sin isn't about the deed done. Sin is about the inner condition of the heart. Sin is about the nature of the being. So you want to drag your sins in here and stack them right here, and we'll all look at them and say, whoa, you did all of that? Well, I'll bring my sins in here, and maybe it won't be as big a stack. I don't know. I don't know how my sins would compare with yours. Okay, I've never been to jail, although I go about every day now, but I've never been to jail. But I don't know. What does that mean? What does that mean? Does that mean anything? Maybe I just didn't get caught. See, there's no place for pride here because I've, we're all in the, in, in the then. And there aren't good sins and bad sins. And I can stand here today and declare to you, I've been as bad as a, I am the chief old pa, apostle Paul. Move over, boy. I am the chief of sinners. Nobody has ever been as bad or worse. Nobody has ever been as bad as I have been. I am the chief of all sinners. I have fought against the will of God. I put my fist in his face, man. I had the nerve to look God right in the eye and say, hey, I'm bigger and more powerful and wiser than you are. And nobody's ever done anything worse than that. Then, see, we've all been there. Brethren, See, that's what he's doing in the passage. So this is not a guy who's saying, hey, I'm going to heap the guilt on you. This is a guy who's saying, hey, I'm going to kneel at the altar with you, man. Why? Because, hey, brethren, we've all been in the then. But wait a minute. There's a now. For the revelation of God has come. And that's what this, that's what this moment is in this exhortation. That he's standing before a whole group and the light of God is being revealed. And Peter, oh, is the instrument through which it's being revealed. Say, whoa, come on. Here's the real truth. Here's what God is really revealing. Here is the now of the whole thing. Yes, there's the then. But oh, think of what he's given you now in the revelation of himself. Would you try to stay in the then? Would you not respond to the now? Quickly, let me move you on into uh, the, pos the posture of theology because this really comes into the depth of what he's trying to say. So he sets up this time period yet now and he ties himself into it intimately with the brethren thing. So, hey, I'm on your plane. I've been in the then and I have experienced the now. And then he moves on and says, I know that you did it in ignorance. I know that you did it in ignorance. No, there is the Greek word oida, which is the whole idea of uh, grasping and Grasping in terms of, uh, of understanding, seeing it. Sometimes we say, oh, I see that, meaning what? Meaning, no, I, I get it. I not only see it physically, but I understand it. So he is saying, oh, I, I, I've, I've got a hold of this. I, I understand this, this then and the now. So he's saying, I've been where you've been. I want to take you back to the uh, Athens thing and the Acts chapter 17 verse 30 deal. And uh, Paul again comes into this scene in Athens and they're all got PhDs, you know, and they're all well educated in discussing philosophy and all of that. And, and he brings up this unknown God deal. And again, he talks to them about how we, this unknown God has made us to be his offspring. And when we are his offspring, oh, we're in his image and that's a whole new deal. 
And when you're in this image thing and you're the offspring, then you look at silver and gold. Those are a product of your artistic designs. Those are a product of your own hands. So let's, what are you worshiping? Stuff that you made instead of the one who made you. That's his whole impact. And then he ends up with this statement that we've already given you, but I want you to look at it again. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands that all men everywhere ought to repent. He sets up, again, a time bracket called times of ignorance. When you begin to trace this through the New Testament, it becomes startling because you begin to understand that there was a then and a now in the whole theological setup of the Scriptures. There's the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, which parallels with the then and the now. In fact, as you begin to walk through the epistles, you begin to discover things like they called this Old Covenant the then. They called it a shadow. For instance, uh, the writer of the book of Hebrews begins to talk like this. He says in chapter 8, verse 5, who served, he's talking about the high priest, they served the copy and the shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. So what he's saying is God came to us and gave us this revelation of how things ought to be. But we only saw and we made it all and we were doing it all. You know, the tabernacle, the offering, the sacrifices, the lighting of candles, doing all that stuff. But it was like a shadow of it. It was, it was a shadow of the real thing. It wasn't, it wasn't the real thing. We've been participating. We've been living in the shadows all this time of the real thing that's about to See, then we were in this period of ignorance. It's the time of ignorance, the shadow stuff. It applies to boxing, shadow boxing. It applies to love, kiss a photograph compared to kissing your wife. Then, now, he says, come on. Don't you realize what's happened? We've moved into a whole new realm that there is a revelation that has come and we're no longer in the then. And because of that, we are called to respond in the now with repentance. Now, Paul does the same identical thing in Colossians 2.16. This is such a phenomenal verse. He's talking about Christ in you and the wonder of all of this revelation of God who's actually come to indwell you in the new covenant. And so he thunders into this chapter and talks about how Jesus has literally taken all of this stuff and he nailed it to the cross, man, and don't be in bondage to it again. And he breaks forth with this. Listen to this. Let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival, or a new moon, or Sabbath, which are shadows. Isn't that a phenomenal statement? They are shadows of things to come. But the substance, the real thing, is Christ. Now, when I first read that, I said, oh, praise the Lord. I can eat anything I want to. I can drink anything I want to drink. No one is to judge me. And, hey, I don't need to pay any attention to any feast day, Sabbath day, out the window, man. New moons don't need, hey, there are no. No, you're not getting this. He says all of that stuff that we had heaped upon us in an Old Testament law structure that was written on tablets of stone, man, that was all exterior forced upon it. That was the shadow. Oh, let me bring you in into the real thing which is Jesus and if you thought the old days the old time Sabbath day was binding on your life woo! think of what an indwelt God will be <laughs> if you think you had to be careful what you ate because he had written some stuff down and said don't eat bats if you think that was severe wait till he comes and lives inside of you <laughs> and begins to direct the very movement of your hand brother See, this was kindergarten compared to, see, we've moved from the then to the now. And yes, this was a time of ignorance. And hey, we all look back and say, whoo, I blew that big time. But wait a minute, revelation has come. And we're in the now. Oh, 
Oh, I relate to that. Then, hey, I can talk about all my, wow, I blew it big time. Well, this I lived, and I did, and I did, and, uh, and hey, I'm trying to forget my past. You're trying to forget yours. Here's the all the then. But folks, we live in a now, and God has brought you to a whole new realm of revelation. What he's done in your life, how he's revealed himself now compared to then. Come on. Are you going to respond to that? Jesus. We've all lived in times of ignorance. But you have never left us there, have you? You have dramatically moved. You have moved circumstances. You've moved our surroundings. You, you, you have come to us yourself. You have just absolutely saturated us in truth. You have seen to it that we got to where we need to, to be in order that you might reveal what you wanted to reveal to us. And, Father, we are no longer in the then. We are standing in the now. This crowd of Jews, yes, they were guilty of all of this in the then, but they're standing in the movement of the Spirit of God, and Peter has just revealed who Jesus is, and they are now in the now. What are they going to do with it? You have been dragging us all into that. I don't want to stay in the then in the name of Jesus. I want to respond to your whole revelation in the now. I don't want to go back. I don't want to slip into the time of ignorance. I don't want to voluntarily push aside what you're trying to reveal in my life. I'm inviting you today to change anything you want to change. Break down any wall you want to break down. Please, Jesus, bring it all. Oh, bring it on. Bigger and better and greater. Reveal yourself beyond anything I have ever experienced up to this time. Allow me to know the depth of your revelation. You are speaking to me, aren't you? And I'm no longer going to be able to say, well, I was just ignorant. Because now you're revealing yourself. And the times of ignorance is, they were in the then. But I'm in the now. What am I going to do? Respond to you? Make it so. Heads are bowed. Let's all admit, we've experienced the then. But dear friend, he's brought you to a new place. You're not where you were. He's been moving your life, drawing you pounding on you, desperately trying to get through to you, opening himself to you, revealing. I want to encourage you. Would you, let, would you just let down all self-defenses? Would, would you just let down all pride? Would you, just, would you just push everything else aside and just respond and say, yes, yes, Jesus, yes. The then is all true, okay. We've all had times of ignorance, no doubt. We've all lived in the then. But this is an hour when he has brought his revelation to our lives. Jump in with both feet, will you? 
Come on, give yourself to this new revelation, will you? Embrace him with this new possibility, will you? Let him carry you forth. Don't stay where you are. Don't slip back into times of ignorance. This is a moment of response. Want to join me? Our altar's open.